Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, we will get started with the pledge from our student representative from Browning, Katie Hamilton. Welcome. Uh, you can now lead us in the pledge. Thank you. Um, if I could have all the participants stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Um, put your hand over your heart, please. And ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We welcome those who are here for purposes of addressing the board at the proper time and in the order of their request. For those who have not already submitted a request, we have provided forms in the back of the room and also have additional copies here in the front of the assistant secretary's position. If you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form indicating your name and the agenda item you wish to address. Uh, you may also make a request to give testimony on an on an item not listed for discussion today. However, full discussion on any items not listed on the agenda will have to be delayed until such time as an item can be publicly posted in advance as a regular agenda item. If you wish to ask questions, please address them to the chair and not to individual members of the board or staff. And having read that, I realize we are not in person. We have been accepting uh, public comment through our new phone system. So uh, from here going forward, when we meet virtually, if you want to make a public comment, uh, check online for the information for our, our phone, our new phone in system. Um, report of action taken in closed session. Uh, the board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's closed session agenda and wishes to report that no reportable actions were taken. So Katie, thank you for being with us today. Um, how about you start us out with a report? Hey. Good evening, everyone. My name is Katherine Hamilton. I am a senior and a member of the first graduating class at Richard D. Browning High School and I'm currently in the hospitality pathway. Currently, I am a student representative in our school site council, and I am also working as an ASB team member. As a reminder, Richard D. Browning High School is a small thematic high school that focus on, focuses on the hospitality and culinary arts pathways. Browning's mission is to provide educational opportunities within the hosp hospitality recreation, tourism, and culinary arts industries. Our school community thrives on opportunity to increase the number of college graduates in our very unique pathways. Our Brown teachers provide an incredible helping hand to their students and work hard to ensure students are feeling comfortable with at-home learning. As a senior, I am currently taking five classes which are block schedule. Block schedule requires classes to be 88 minutes long. All of my teachers have been so gracious and helpful in offering assistance or needed breaks during our classes. Our teachers also offer flexible due dates and thorough step-by-step -step instructions. Some of our Browning teachers also offer tutoring time during our unscheduled eighth period. The ASB newsletter team devotes time every meeting to ensure our Browning student newsletter is up to date and has useful information for our student body. Our newsletter includes our at-home learning schedule, upcoming events, and even information about local companies that are hiring. It also includes a teacher of the week and a student of the week to promote a sense of community. ASB has also worked on a student engagement survey. This survey was created to figure out how we can improve our students' particip participation in Zoom classes. One of our tasks as an ASB team was to create an individual student outreach program one of our ASB team members, Mason Barrett, reaches up to students who request one-on-one request -on -one help. He offers his time to help answer students' general questions 
provide them to the correct faculty member they need to talk to, or provide freshmen with informa information that they need. Our on-site school staff has been working tirelessly to keep our school clean and safe for when student students and teachers return to school. If students need to visit the Browning campus, our staff ensures to maintain social distancing and to observe safe health regulations while providing a pleasant experience. Our staff and faculty have also been planning a virtual school-wide event to promote school culture and community. Browning's hospitality program uses the NAFTRAC program through comprehensive classes, and our culinary program uses the CCAP program to help students competitively improve their skills. The NAFTRAC program has provided many useful classes for students to learn more about the hospitality industry. The CCAP program has helped benefit students who have taken part in CCAP cooking competitions. This is our first year entering seniors into the CCAP competitions for scholarships, and we are so excited to cheer them on. For our culinary students, over 300 kits will be put together for students to check out like textbooks. They will be used they will be able to use these for at-home labs or in class. Utensils like spatulas, mixing bowls, measuring spoons, measuring cups, whisks, and cutting boards will all be included. Our baking and pastry students received a donation from King Arthur's Bake for Good program. The Browning team was able to portion these out to create at-home lab baking kits, including all-purpose flour, whole wheat flour, yeast, bread bags, utensils, and a reusable bag. Our students also have the opportunity to take college classes with the dual, en pro dual enrollment program at Long Beach City College. This year, some of our senior students are taking Introduction to Business, Ethnic Studies, and Introduction to Criminal Justice. The dual enrollment programs help students see a fresh perspective into their future college lives. Another opportunity for our students is applying for a virtual internship for freeconferencecall.com. In the second semester, they will complete a business plan and create their own video cooking series or travel magazine. As the first graduating class, we are excited and eager for our future. We are so thankful for the memories we have made. Browning has and will continue to prepare us for our future and beyond. Despite the circumstances, our teachers and staff are doing the best they can to provide us with the meaningful educational experience while maintaining rigor. We look forward to returning to school and sending our seniors off with a bang. All of us at Browning High School would like to thank the members of the school board, Superintendent Baker, and our principal, Dr. Anderson, for all of your guidance during this challenging time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Well, as you're talking about being part of the first graduating class at Browning, my fingers are crossed that we can turn this whole situation around and we can have a fabulous graduation ceremony for you and your classmates. That would be a wonderful motivation for us to uh, wear a mask, social distance, all that kind of thing. So we understand if you have homework and you can't spend the rest of the uh, evening with us for this board meeting, you can stay as long as you as you'd like. You're welcome. But we understand if you have other things to do. So thank you again, Katie. Thank um, you so much. <laughs> uh, next on the agenda, uh, public hearing. We have none. Uh, call for agenda items for separate action. Adoption of the agenda as posted. Move approval of the agenda. Second. Discussion. We'll have a roll call vote, so all in favor, Dr. Benitez. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Mr. Meyer. Dr. Williams. Aye. Um, Mr. Meyer, you were muted, but I saw you. Now I'm unmuted. Felton did it to me again, dog on him. I said hi. Okay. Thank you. I just want to make sure that we're on the up and up. So, Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? 5-0. Uh, 
Uh, approval of minutes. Move approval. Second. Okay. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Business? Aye. Uh, Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, passes 5 0. Uh, communications. Recognition of retiring Board of Education members. Uh, Ms. Kerr, would you like to start? I certainly will. Uh, normally, we would have someone stand in front of us, but we see Dr. Williams on the screen. Whereas Dr. Felton Williams is retiring after more than 16 years of dedicated service on the Long Beach Unified School District Board of Education, including five terms as president. And whereas he joined the school board after a long and distinguished career in higher education, working as an administrator at Cal State Long Beach, Cal State Dominguez Hills, Sacramento City College and Long Beach City College. And whereas he was instrumental in LBUSD's strategic planning the academic and career success initiative and many other key efforts to provide equitable opportunities to all students, regardless of their color, culture, language challenges or socioeconomic background. And whereas he brought national honor and recognition to LBUSD through his service on the executive committee of the Washington DC based Council of Great City Schools and he earned the National Urban Educator Green Gardner Award in 2017. And whereas he has advocated for and helped to lead vital efforts, including improved access to advanced placement courses, ethnic studies, and facilities master planning in partnership with community allies, and his optimism, tenacity, and genuine concern and care for children will be missed. Now, therefore, be it resolved that his colleagues on the Board of Education commend and express a deep gratitude to Dr. Felton Williams for his significant and lasting contributions to the education of thousands of students. Congratulations, Dr. Williams. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you. And I understand we have a special guest who would like to say a few words. So, Mr. Hubbard. Well, good uh, good afternoon. I, I assume I'm the special guest. I thank you. You are. Giving me the the honor of addressing the board and the many teachers and employees and parent volunteers who help to educate our, our children. Uh, it, it, by the way, it does not get said enough, so let me say thank you to all of you, um, both as a parent with two children who attended Long Beach schools and as a prosecutor who understands uh, the importance of high quality schools. Um, I just wanna thank everyone, uh, all the board members, uh, all of you, uh, you know, entirely for all that you do. You know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has stopped much of American life this year, but I did not want it to stop me from congratulating uh, soon to be retiring school board members like John Meyer and, and Dr. Felton Williams, and just to acknowledge the incredible, uh, really immeasurable contribution um, that both of them have made uh, to the education of tens of thousands of, of students. Many of our students, by the way, live below uh, the poverty line. Many are foster children, many are homeless. Um, but, you know, we believe all of them deserve the best possible education. And that's why Dr. Williams and John Meyer ran for school board in the first place. And they've done a, a, just a fantastic job for us. Um, so I wanted to congratulate both of them. But, but let me just turn uh, my comments uh, briefly um, to, to Dr. Felton Williams. I know that we're, uh, you know, accommodating or congratulating both of them, but a lot of people don't know the impact that Dr. Williams has made on the criminal justice system in Long Beach, uh, buying through my office. Um, a lot of his educational accomplishments are pretty well known, but I wanted to to share with with everyone, uh, for those who do not know, um, just how supportive uh, he has been of my office in a number of areas. And, and by the way, we did not partner, my office, the city prosecutor's office, did not partner with the school district up until really the last decade. And it's because of people like John Meyer and Felton Williams and all of you um, that we've been able to do that. But our, our office has been uh, doing a lot connecting children who need mentors with, um, with mentors in the community. Uh, we've been working with the school district on gang intervention programs that help uh, keep kids in school and away from gangs. And then uh, the biggest uh, is probably our truancy reduction program, 
where we partner with uh, with some of the principals and the schools that are having truancy challenges to make sure that uh, all the obstacles are removed so that kids are in their seat every day. So th those are things that uh, will never be reported uh, on uh, in the minutes of an agenda of a meeting. Um, there's really no way to describe uh, the advice uh, that I've gotten from Dr. Williams every month of every year uh, that we've been partnering uh, together. And he has shared with me his experience um, as a black man and as a person growing up in Southern California, what, what the criminal justice system uh, means to him and, and what it has meant to him and his family. Uh, the amount of learning that I've done in the last uh, 10 years as city prosecutor could, could not have been accomplished without, uh, without his support. So I just wanted to add that. Um, I know that they will be acknowledged for many of the educational things that they do uh, and continue to do and thank God for both of them on our, on our school board. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to add that uh, to the record uh, and, and hopefully someday there's a way I can more, um, uh, more fitting of this honor um, show my appreciation. But um, Dr. Williams in, in ways quiet and subtle and unknown to many has made a, a significant positive change in uh, the lives of many people who found alternatives to incarceration, alternatives to, to court proceedings um, because of the guidance he's given my office. So uh, I just wanna thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, congratulations, time to dust off the fishing pole. Uh, and I look forward to, uh, to spending more time with you after you retire from the school board. And congratulations also, uh, uh, John Meyer, to you and thank you for all the, the support you've given my office and my family as well. So thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I would like to um, read a resolution for John Meyer. Whereas John Meyer is retiring after more than 17 years of dedicated service on the Long Beach Unified School District Board of Education, including three terms as president. And whereas he has dedicated his life to local schools where he worked for 42 years as a highly respected teacher, coach, and principal at Lowell, Milliken, Lakewood, Poly, Avalon, and Wilson schools, and as a teacher at Long Beach City College. And whereas he attended Willard Elementary School, Jefferson Middle School, and Wilson High School, he is among four generations of Myers to attend and or teach in our local schools. And whereas during his time on the Board of Education, he has helped to navigate extremely difficult challenges, including the Great Recession, while ensuring the preservation of the school district's vital missions and its status as a high functioning organization that is respected nationally and internationally for striving to serve all students, no matter what challenges they may face. And whereas the genuine personal connection that he has made with colleagues and others in the wider community during his long career as an LBUSD employee and board member have served the school district remarkably well. And through his unwavering and encouraging leadership, he has helped to keep the school district centered first and foremost on the well-being of students. Now, therefore, be it resolved that his colleagues on the Board of Education commend and express deep gratitude to John Meyer for his significant and lasting contributions to the education of thousands of students. And what we're missing by being, you know, online and, and having this meeting virtually is that we don't get to shake your hands. We don't get to uh, express that emotion personally. It's it's very tough. This is only the first of a couple of different goodbyes that we have set up. We're starting early, starting in November. Dr. Williams, you have a couple more meetings. Uh, Mr. Meyer, a couple more meetings. And we intend to uh, acknowledge you at each of those meetings. So thank you. This is the uh, first of many things. Diana, can we comment? Is it okay, okay. to comment? Thank yes. you. Um, um, thank you, Megan, very much for, for the reading of the resolution. And 
Thank you, Doug. Um, Doug and I have traveled a lot of paths together and he's very dear to me, extremely dear to me and uh, my family. Um, you know, it's, 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 I know it's time to say farewell, but it, how do you say farewell to 16 years? Uh, you know, I first came to the board 2004 while I was still serving as dean over at City College and having to uh, adjust to the district's culture and becoming familiar, familiar with the process in the district was a major bit of a learning curve and uh, becoming acquainted with the, the nuances and dynamics of the district. Uh, but was very, the folks in the district were extremely helpful. And uh, also serving uh, on the Council of Great City Schools added a dimension to the work that was very important for me to see and understand the impact of our district. Uh, I did have that uh, a, a moment where running for the fourth term was a bit of a, a problem. And what I didn't share with a lot of people was that uh, I had to go through lung cancer surgery in 2016 in December, December 3rd. And uh, I had to make a decision between December 15th and January 15th, whether to run for reelection. I didn't share that with anybody because I wasn't sure of how that would be interpreted if I decided to run. When the doctor cleared me uh, uh, the following week and said the cancer had not spread, then I decided to run for re-election. Um, and one of the first times uh, where I didn't have an opponent and I thought I was going to get away scot-free, but at the last day, at the last moment, someone filed to run. And so I had to get out and mount a full campaign. So, uh, but we were, we were successful. You know, my focus on the board is really shaped by what I experienced in the 50s, 50s and 60s uh, as an African-American and a very vivid and real understanding of the inequities in a lot of our basic structures. And uh, so for me, it's always been about advocating for fairness with every opportunity that I can get. And none of that changed when I became a member of the board. And none of that will change as I depart as a member of the board. It's always been my basic assumption is, why should anyone be treated differently? Uh, I do recall being asked to attend a meeting in the city with some very influential people. And they wanted me to change my position on our vote to uh, uh, review the uh, um, uh, skip report from the railroad and their efforts to build transfer stations near our schools. And I was told at that meeting that if I didn't change, that I would lose their support um, for my reelection. That the, the railroad also sent a sizable contribution to my campaign. Um, that when I spoke with Doug about it, Doug said, send it back airmail. Thank you, Doug, for that. Uh, but uh, my thought going through was, who's going to speak up for the kids? Who's going to advocate on their behalf? Well, needless to say, I did not get that support, but that was okay. Moving forward, I'm gonna pass the baton to Eric Miller. I think he'll do a fantastic job. Currently, I'm serving as president of the African American Cultural Center in Long Beach. It's a new, newly established 501c3 with a state mission to celebrate the cultural heritage of African Americans in the city of Long Beach and beyond. By the way, Chris Steinhauser thought he would be getting away, but he's working with me, as well as Judy Seal. We're working presently to develop the infrastructure. We put together strategic goals and objectives. We have the Articles of Incorporation approved. We've established programming focus for the, uh, for the, for the facility that would look at uh, art in Long Beach, 
the military in Long Beach and education is the areas that we'll focus on. Recently signed a lease for property on Long Beach Boulevard that will serve as our temporary headquarters for exhibits and cultural events. So I'm still going to be busy, folks. In conclusion, it's been a blend of unique challenges and opportunities as a member of the board. And I've been extremely pleased to see the development of an equity policy unfolding. It's been a wonderful experience in working with board colleagues, administrative staff, teachers and parents, Chris and Jill. I feel fortunate in the lessons that I've learned and I hope I've been able to make a contribution and thank you all so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Okay, let's move to public testimony on items. Listed. Diana, what, John may want to have to say a few words as well. So, John. Okay, yeah. Mr. Mayor. Well, first, first of all, congratulations to Felton Williams and the mark that he's left on our district. He's been a wonderful friend, a colleague, a teacher, a mentor, uh, just a wonder, wonderful man. Um, I have nothing but uh, thanks to the entire district. I'm proud of our board. Every one of our board members put students first and student outcomes above everything else. I'm very proud of Jill and of course, Chris, Chris Steinhauser um, and their staff. It's everything in my experience from kindergarten through 12th grade to teaching and being a principal and a board member, uh, everything has been uh, very selfish in the sense that so many people have given to me. Uh, uh, I just deeply appreciate uh, everything the district, the students, the support staff have given to me in terms of close, intimate friendships and uh, I respect them all deeply. So thank you very much. Uh, it's always been a pleasure. And I look forward to serving as a VIP at my old elementary school, Willard. It's a very needy place. So to go in and work with those little kids uh, will remain a, a, a future goal of mine. Thank you so much. John, you've got two more opportunities to take shots at me, just two. All right. <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to reserve them for the next meeting. I don't want to blow everything in one night. <laughs> All right, my friend. Thanks, Felton. Congratulations. Okay. You're the best. You too, John. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Um, now we will move to public testimony on items listed on the agenda. <laughs> and I don't believe we have any. No, we don't. Okay. So uh, we have none public testimony on items not listed on the agenda i know we have one yes and this is our first uh telephone submission yes that is correct um it will be played right now million elementary and secondary school emergency relief SR funds 23 million a total of 90 million dollars that a school district was to receive it spent before December 31st to date 83 percent of the funds have been spent about 75 million where did it go as a parent I still don't know where and how these funds have been spent to academically support our students invest in their social emotional learning trauma and parent student engagement we want to hear how you will be spending the rest of these funds $15,190,340 to meet the needs of our students and parents, particularly our highest need students. I have spent the last three months buying supplies for my kinder and second grader over and over to support their virtual learning experience, but very well aware that 70% of our student body does not have the same resources. I've supported various fundraisers across our city and district to support the growing needs of families. 
Earlier this year, I saw teachers fundraise for technology like a document meter to enhance the virtual learning experience and wondered, why are parents being asked to support these items when a district had $90 million to meet this moment? My second thought was, if our school has the means to financially support teacher requests, what about other school sites? Did the district make the school available to every teacher through these funds? If so, did the district communicate to teachers that these resources are available at every school site? I have seen teachers fundraise for headsets for the students. My second graders Chromebook continues to give us connectivity and mic issues. After three failed attempts in replacing the Chromebook 5 with another Chromebook 5, I gave up and purchased the laptop for her. I know this is a privilege. Is the district buying and actively replacing Chrome 5 books with the sixth latest version? If it's not, it should. Parent and teachers are spending out of their own pocket money to support the students. Why are parents being asked to support when these funds are intended to purchase these items? This district has $15 million left to spend before December 31st. And I, parents should know where the funds are being spent to support our students. Thank you. Thank you. So that was our first attempt. Um, we're off to a little bit of a slow start, but it worked out, so that's good. Um, I should also note that, that the um, transcribed message will be part of the public record. Is that true? Okay, yes, that is correct. Okay, so um, in addition to that, each board member has been um, given those remarks uh, as well. Okay, now we move to staff report. There is none. Business items, personnel, Dr. Williams. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I have a personnel report uh, prepared by Assistant Superintendent of HR, David Zade, and a approved by the superintendent, Dr. Jill Baker. I'll read the classified portion of the report first. There were 32 appointments, 25 leaves of absence, one separation, deceased, 10 resignations, seven retirements, one abolishment, lack of work, lack of funds, two amendments, and two rescissions. On the certificated portion, there were 23 appointments, 12 in-service changes, nine leaves of absence, one retirement, I move approval. Move approval. Second. Second. Uh, discussion. Hmm. All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Uh, any opposed, abstentions, passive. Finance report A. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes 5 0. Finance report B. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Yes, Madam Chair, I recuse myself from participation in finance report B on the consent calendar. I have a potential financial interest under government code 1091 and 87100. My husband works for a subcontractor who has done work for the payees. Okay, thank you. Um, all in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. So that passes 4-0 with one abstention. Business department report. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Yes, Madam President. I just wanted to highlight um, and acknowledge the $30,000 grant that we received from the Norris Foundation for our robotics program at uh, CAMS. Um, just thank you, a wonderful opportunity for students. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a fabulous uh, contribution to the robotics program. Um, any further discussion? One more uh, thing, um, Madam President, and I, I thought I had seen it somewhere else on the agenda. Uh, apologies if I missed it. 
um, regarding the grant proposal for um, externships for uh, teachers. Did I did I miss something in our agenda, or was it included? Um, number eight on the business department report. Yes. So uh, again, just want to highlight that I think this is great that we're going after. Uh, this is a grant proposal uh, to provide externship opportunities, build our capacity uh, as a district to advance our CTE efforts. Wondering if anyone on our executive staff could speak a little bit more to it, because I think particularly in this time with many fiscal constraints and budget challenges, uh, that our, built, our, our district is, is still looking for opportunities to advance our mission and values, and in this case, uh, with our career tech ed efforts. Sure, Dr. Benitez, uh, thank you. This is a great opportunity. It's a, a, a grant from the state, as you all know, that coming, comes to our uh, K-12 work and building that CTE and pathway, a career pathway work with our teachers from Long Beach City College and teachers from Long Beach Unified. It's a two to three day summer uh, connection with really real business uh, experience for them to bring in, tie it in with our students as they come to our schools during the school year. So excellent opportunity for us. Thank you, Dr. Camarino. Thank you. Well, okay, all in favor, Dr. Benitez. Aye. Ms. Kurt. Aye. Mr. Meyer. Aye. Dr. Williams. Aye. I vote aye. Opposed abstentions, process 5-0. Purchasing and contracts report. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Mr. Meyer. Aye. Dr. Williams. Aye. I vote aye. Opposed abstentions, passes 5-0. Uh, superintendent items, Dr. Baker. Thank you, President Craighead and members of the board, I'm rec recommending the expulsion of the following student. Student number 698. The student listed, listed would be expelled under education code 48915C4. Prior to being considered for possible readmission, the student will be required to successfully complete a specific program of rehabilitation designed to prevent further misconduct and to promote academic success. I move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Mr. Meyer. Aye. Dr. Williams. Aye. I vote aye. Opposed, abstentions, passes 5-0. Um, unfinished business, we have none. New business, California School Employees Association, CSEA, COVID-19 school opening memorandum of understanding. Uh, Mr. Rockenbach, would you like to address this? Uh, thank you, Ms. Craighead and board members and, and esteemed colleagues. Um, we were very fortunate to get the news yesterday evening that our CSCA bargaining team was able to ratify the MOU that we've been working on together for the past couple of months. And it was a wonderful process where we were able to collaborate, work together, and really try to develop a, an agreement that helped both our employees stay safe, as well as support our students' needs and help carry out the mission of our district. Some of the key areas that I wanted to address is first of all, wanted to thank the commitment of our CSCA bargaining team for their effort and their willingness to be open and honest in their communication. We wanted to thank the district team because there's a number of district members who spent a lot of hours working through this process and provided great insight. And having the two teams come together and really share where they're coming from, I think helped develop this uh, MOU. Some of the key areas that were a primary focus in the MOU was safety. And both of our teams felt that this was our number one priority, to be able to keep students, staff, and families safe. Areas that we really focused on were things such as proper screening when people arrive at the workplace, making sure everybody had access to the proper protective equipment. I'm sure we're gonna think of PPE for the rest of our lives as we move forward, but that was such an important part making sure we're on the same page when it came to cleaning and making sure our campuses were, were taken care of each day. 
And then also in the event, like we've seen throughout our communities, when there is positive cases, to make sure we're working together for contact tracing to minimize the impacts of that. A second part of it was developing a, a fair leave process for our employees. Uh, part of what we've been working with our employees is they have access to the emergency sick leave program that came through our CARES Act. But one of the concerns from our, our bargaining members was the need that if they had a second quarantine to be able to have leave to be able to access. And so part of the agreement was providing our employees up to 10 additional um, leave days for quarantine needs. The third part was to be able to allow some of our employees who work directly with our students in the classroom to have work location flexibility like our teachers. So that was another part of our MOU and our employees will be able to start processing for that um, if this is approved by our Board of Education. We also wanted to make sure that we recognize and understood that our employees that were considered at high risk by the health department had access to our interactive process if some of those risk factors uh, hampered their work here at the sites. And then lastly, we wanted to have a process to where we could come together and address our concerns in a collaborative manner moving forward. And so what you have before you is the hard work and ded dedication of both our CSEA and TAL bargaining unit teams. And we present this to you for your approval. Thank you. I move approval. I second. Discussion. Yes, Madam President. Um, I just wanted to uh, echo Mr. Rockenbach's um, thanks uh, to both our district negotiating team and to the CSEA uh, bargaining team. Um, I'm, I'm very appreciative that they um, came to the best agreement possible, uh, given that our CSEA members are the backbone of our district. And oftentimes, uh, maybe from a public perspective, go unnoticed, uh, but they are at the core, uh, thousands of them, at ensuring our student success. So uh, many thanks, uh, Steve, to, to you and our uh, district bargaining team, as well as to our uh, CSEA bargaining team for, for reaching the best possible agreement possible. Yeah, and I'll just add to that that um, our classified staff have been working really hard nonstop since the schools shut down. Um, they didn't take time off or away from the schools because they have been busy sanitizing and moving things around. Um, they've been in our offices answering calls, acting as tech support, um, doing those things that make this virtual uh, learning easier for families and for students. So we greatly appreciate the work that they have continued to do throughout this pandemic while living themselves and their families within this pandemic. So I am grateful uh, that we came to an agreement and for everyone who came to the table to work hard um, for our employees and for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further discussion? And I'd like to thank my colleagues for pointing out those things that that our classified employees are the ones who have been there, well, with, with other staff members, along with other staff members, and we rely on them so much. And they do have the interest of our students at heart, the, the best interest of our students at heart. So it is, it is wonderful that we have these teams that can work together and come up with um, a solution that's good for everybody. Okay, so um, all in favor, Dr. Benitez. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Mr. Meyer. Aye. Dr. Williams. Aye. I vote aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes? 5 0. Uh, board Policy 1312.3 Uniform Complaint Procedures. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Yeah, just a quick question, uh, Dr. Baker. Uh, I know these come up occasionally, our board policies that have come up for revision in order to comply either with uh, state laws that have changed. I'm wondering if these uh, few do that. I do realize high school graduation requirements, which comes up is probably more COVID related, uh, but if you could just give an overview of uh, why the board policy changes are tonight. 
Sure, Mr. Zaid's gonna jump in on the two coming out of his office. Sure, so uh, two of the board policies coming for uh, from HR are specifically UCP and then the next one right behind it, uh, sexual harassment. Um, for the uniform complaint uh, procedure, uh, it was, uh, as you stated, uh, Ms. Kerr, uh, an update from the California Department of Education. The update came out on July 1st of 2020. And so the revisions are um, small adjustments are really in compliance with that update. Um, there were several things that were added and a few things that were adjusted, specifically um, preschool complaints um, being added. And so uh, one of the things that we want to do is always ensure that our board policies comply with uh, those recent updates. In the same way, a new Title, law, uh, title IX law went into place for sexual harassment, and that became effective August 14th. So the very next board policy um, right behind this one is, in it, in it, again, to ensure that we comply with those uh, updates. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Five through. Board policy P5145.7 sexual harassment. Move approval. Second. Discussion. All in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Opposed abstentions passes five zero. Resolution 11120-A, statutory school facility fees, including alternative school facility fees, reportable fees, report for fiscal year 2019-2020, reportable fee report, and findings thereon. Madam President, did we skip over our um, high school uh, requirement yeah. policy? Um, we did. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Um, since I just read that last one, that's really long. Let's go ahead and take care of that. And I promise to go back to the high school one. Just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. <laughs> uh, oh no, you were you were on it. it. It was I who missed it. Okay, so we'll do that um, school facility fee one and then go back to the high school one. Mr. Miranda is here to open the discussion about that resolution. Thank you, Ms. Craighead and Dr. Baker, members of the board and executive staff. I'll be fairly brief here. Um, first and foremost, government code allows school districts to collect impact fees or developer fees from new residential developments, commercial and industrial developments. Um, wherever there's, um, wherever we're, we're able to demonstrate that we have to mitigate the impact of these new developments on facilities in the school district. The same government code section also requires that we uh, comply with certain reporting requirements. And that includes a certain list of factors for the previous reporting year and also what we propose on expenditures for the current fiscal year or next fiscal year. Um, so for this past year, we started with a be beginning balance of roughly $3.2 million in our developer fee account. We collected close to $6.5 million um, and our expenditures totaled a little over $7.7 .7 million. Our ending balance as of June 30th, 2020 was 1.9. 1 uh, I state that for reference, but also because it was an important factor for us. One of our personal goals was to reduce the carryover balance from last year to this year. And we were able to achieve that kind of going from 3.2 to roughly 1.9 where we stand now. Um, the primary expenditure for this past year was over at or allocated to Millican High School's new building, uh, new classroom building. Uh, about 7.5 million was dedicated to that project in and of itself. The remaining fees were just basically administrative fees. Uh, of course, that frees up bond dollars, right? So uh, us ab able to leverage those dollars frees up bond dollars for other future projects in the district. With respect to this next year, uh, we don't anticipate collecting $6.5 million, probably something a little south of that, uh, but we've identified a few potential projects 
over at Jordan and Lakewood high schools. Um, and we can do basically do the same and achieve the same and leverage our own bond dollars. Um, we were able to establish a nexus um, with these reporting fees and, and the fees we collect to those projects, which is what the report requires. Um, so really at this point in time, we're, staff is recommending approval and adoption of this resolution, uh, which would demonstrate compliance with government code sections 66001 and 66006. Thank you, Mr. Miranda. Do we have any uh, further discussion or any questions? Yeah, David, thank you for that overview. Much appreciated. Love that background picture you have there, David. <laughs> I, I, I plugged it in when I saw yours. <laughs> I move approval. Thank you. Second. I see what I did there. Oh. Okay, so now do we have any discussion that it's been moved and seconded? Yes, Dr. Benitez. Yes, thank you, Mr. Miranda. So um, it, has our strategy been, and, and, I, and I totally understand it, um, to use these funds to, for our facilities. That way we can leverage uh, our bond, bond money. Is that the strategy? Uh, partly that, but also where we can demonstrate that nexus, right? So as we're getting these developments in certain regions in the district, we attempt to funnel those dollars to those direct schools in the area. Thank you, understood. And uh, question, uh, another question. David, uh, the, the rationale and reason for the facilities fees are to make sure that if there's uh, new uh, student growth uh, in the city, that the fees would accommodate that growth. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So are we getting new students? <laughs> I, I, I sure hope so. We, we look at student generation rates on a regular basis. That's something we'll continue to monitor. All right. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we're ready for the vote. So all in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Opposed abstentions passes 5-0. And as promised, board policy 6146.1, high school graduation requirements. Move approval. Second. Discussion? All in favor, Dr. Benitez? I, I'm, I'm sorry, dude. Uh, I, I, I had a glitch, uh, Madam President. Can I ask a question? <laughs> you may. Uh, yeah, so I missed like 10 seconds before. There was a, there was a pause on my, did, did we skip the discussion? We, yes. I missed it. I, I missed. I may have missed the discussion. I apologize. Oh, it's okay because we haven't voted yet. I was going to you for the first vote, so we can have a discussion at this point. And it's for our high school graduation requirements, right? That we went back. To. <laughs> yes, that's the one. Yes. Yeah. I guess my question is um, uh, understanding that we had to adjust our requirements, right, because of our pandemic and and our, us going remote. Um, either a question for Dr. Camarino or, or anyone on executive staff, um, sort of what our thinking and strategy is now, uh, given that we do have challenges um, with um, supporting our high school students. And I'm wondering just what, what kind of strategies, interventions, supports we're going to put in play uh, to help continue uh, supporting uh, our students, but also, um, you know, recognizing that um, you know, we have a different playing field, so to speak, uh, this, this, this academic year and sort of what our thinking is in terms of those high school students that are particularly challenged uh, this year. So any, any thoughts on strategies, Dr. Camarino, or what we've been thinking about um, would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Benitez. Uh, definitely, we know during this pandemic, it's a real challenge. And so two things to consider as we develop our graduation requirements. One is we changed them last year because of COVID and students, especially our seniors who didn't have an opportunity to at on March 13th to be able to make up the credits needed in order to graduate. So we designed our master schedules in 
in a preparation for our requirements to go back to the way they were pre-COVID. So our master schedule design at all of our high schools are for the 220 credits that our students should have when they finish high school. So that's one piece. The second piece definitely, so the master schedule has a determining factor onto the graduation requirements that are gonna help. The other factor that's huge is to your point, the, the system that we know is, is in need of our at promise students and our struggling students who are trying to get the credits they need to move forward. And the, the connections that our schools are making is that we definitely have to look at the shifting of the master schedule uh, using credit recovery, APEX and different things that we have at our schools to ensure that our students are getting the master schedule and the schedule that's very differentiated and looking at perhaps even making some changes to the master schedule to say, these are the classes we were going to offer for second semester. We're really looking at and pointing to uh, how we can design classes for our students to make up credits, but also even looking at ideas of what we're gonna do for our summer school programs also. So there is the notion of a zero to an eighth period class opportunities for students to get uh, uh, chances to make up credits during zero period, during eighth period, and also during their unscheduled periods that we were already assigning our students to have. So those are things that we're working on actually tomorrow at our principals meeting that we'll have. Uh, and again, we'll have a, a plan of action for our students that are falling behind tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Camarillo. Just to follow up to that, that's precisely where I was coming from with my question. I, I guess my, as part of that, my, my concern is um, realizing that this may have, since we rescheduled our, our uh, board workshop, much of this conversation probably was going to be covered in terms of how we are measuring progress right now, Dr. Camarillo. Don't, don't want you to spend a lot of time on it, but you know, uh, given, given what you just described, how are we keeping tabs on, on progress and identifying those students that you know, would need our additional supports? Oh, definitely. Our focus has been looking at now with our new system through Canvas is how to grab the data of our DF rates. So we're looking at our DF rates of our students right now, especially within our pathways. So our administrators, our counselors are looking really uh, closely at our pathway uh, success with students who are receiving Ds and Fs and allocating our resources, our site money, our site resources towards those interventions and students and, and, and credit recovery that our students are gonna need by pathway by specifically looking tomorrow at our DF rates by pathway at all of our schools. Do you wanna add anything to that in terms of the, the policy changes? No, I think Dr. Camarino did a wonderful job in answering the questions. And thanks to the high school office, specifically Dr. Camarino and Carol Ortega, who facilitated conversation with head counselors at the high schools to make sure that the policy that comes before you this evening reflects both the change from the suspension of our local requirements, but also is current in the work that we're doing going forward. So thank you, Jay, for that explanation. Dr. Brown, thank you. And I wanted to make sure I wanted to, you know, again, Carol Ortega, the head counselors and all of our counselors system-wide in our high school level have just been, you know, working day and night to really try to meet the needs of our students, not just prior to the DFs coming out for the quarter, but even within the first day of school of connecting to make sure our students had bandwidth, had a Chromebook, had the connections to the whole SEL component to our students. And they're still working very hard on connecting with our students that way. So a shout out to our counselors who are working working efforts effortlessly to bring our students back to the most normal feel possible and in, in ensuring that we have that graduation requirement met for all of our students. Thank you for that explanation and background. Do we have any uh, further questions? For discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor, Dr. Benitez? Aye. Ms. Kern? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Dr. Williams? Aye. I vote aye. Opposed? Abstention? Passes 5 0. And now we are, we are at equity policy development update. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Brown? Good evening, thank you. And I just have a brief update this evening. Uh, we are celebrating receiving 168 applications for the equity leadership. I said 268 applications. So I think that that tells a story 
of our community's interest in this topic and their willingness to become involved. Um, in that 268 are majority parents and community members, as well as about a third staff members who are willing to speak and give their time and share their experience and, and expertise. And that number has caused us to regroup a little bit. So we'll be moving forward with the idea of accepting about 30 people to be a part of an equity leadership advisory team. But we absolutely don't want to lose the momentum, the interest, and the ability to really have a large representative group as a working group to uh, gather ideas, seek input, and run policy ideas through. So we are delaying the not the, uh, the announcement of the official equity leadership team for a couple of weeks. And I'm working with a small committee to come up with some ways to larger use the, the huge group that we got. So I'm, I'm really celebrating the interest and just wanting to garnish all of that good energy as we go forward. Well, that sounds like a good problem to have. I called it good trouble, and I, I stand by that. Okay, do we have any uh, questions for Dr. Brown? Yeah, it would be just a comment. Um, yeah, uh, I had mentioned uh, uh, previously um, uh, the, actually the, uh, the, the impetus uh, that I have for this process and for this equity piece that's coming into the district. And I, I just have to go back to uh, uh, the first time I, I came on board in the district is one of the things that I have been most interested in. And after, and I know we've made movement towards that during the 16 years that I've been here. I'm glad to see it finally being formalized in a way that will have us look at what we do in the district through a bigger lens, you know, as it talks about equity. And so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see this, even though I'm leaving, I'm pleased to see it coming to fruition uh, as the work that will be going forward in the district. And thank you all uh, for your focus and your concentration on this matter. And it, will pay huge dividends uh, for our students uh, in the years ahead. So thank you very much, Tiffany. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Benitez. Dr. Brown, can I, can I pitch an idea to you given that we had so much interest? Oh, absolutely. So, so beyond the 30 or so that, that'll make up the um, equity leadership team, is there a way to um, identify for all of the additional folks um, any neighborhood school connections? And might we consider uh, sort of having some representative advisory or, or, or you know, body uh, to support those 30 or so team by, by school site, if we can identify uh, those, those folks by neighborhood school? It's a wonderful idea. And it's in line with, with one of the ideas that we're talking about, which is how we can use the leadership of some of the staff that have expressed interest in conjunction with the specific schools that our parents or community members are representing or, or have connection to. So I think there's a lot of potential there. And um, I, I just don't wanna say no to 220 some people. I wanna say yes to a core group and I wanna say thank you so much. And here's how you can also work with us to that other larger group, so. Thank you for the idea, much appreciated. Well, I'm glad to I'm glad to know that we're going to make use of all of those volunteers and all of the people who want to be involved. I think that is great news. Uh, do we have any further questions or discussion? Okay, well, let's move to report of board members. Uh, vote on that yet? Diane? Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Williams, you had- Did we vote on that yet? Did we didn't we need to vote? vote, Dr. Williams. It was just an announcement item. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so let's start with uh, Dr. Benitez. Thank you, Madam President. And I just want to uh, personally take a moment to thank our retiring school board members here, Dr. Williams and Mr. Meyer, uh, in addition to the uh, beautiful words that were read in the resolutions. Just wanted to personally thank them for, for their service, for their years of service and for their commitment uh, to the success of all of our students. Um, I, I wanted to share uh, you know, that since we weren't able out of an abundance of, of caution and precaution for everyone's health that we weren't able to have our uh, previously scheduled board workshops um, yesterday and, and part of today, um, that there was a lot on, on those agendas originally around measuring progress, right? Measuring progress for our Latinx students, for our highest need students, um, English learners, things like that. If there was a way um, to um, get pieces of those uh, in upcoming so that we wouldn't have to wait to another board uh, workshop. I know that the presentations can be shared, uh, but I wanted to see if we could explore dedicating some time um, at our next couple of meetings and then moving forward where we could sort of not piecemeal that out, but get parts of that. Uh, because I, I think um, there's a lot of time right between now and our next board workshop. We only have two more meetings. Uh, two more meetings, gentlemen, uh, in December, uh, and then we go on break, then we come back and it's sort of, you know, we, we get back to our work. So uh, just wanted to share if we could, you know, the ask really is if we could get some of those uh, presentations, have some dialogue at our upcoming uh, board meetings, particularly around the progress, uh, right? And, and, and what interventions, support strategies are best thinking. Um, I know that we had a presentation scheduled for our um, K-8 uh, students, right? That's one of those areas that I know Dr. Lund has been spending a lot of time with, with our team on. So, um, you know, looking forward to, to seeing and hearing and having an opportunity to have some dialogue uh, in that. Lastly, I wanted to share, and I shared this with Dr. Baker, uh, if it wasn't last month, it was the previous uh, month, that I have had the opportunity in my district to hold uh, some virtual community office hours uh, with, with community members, given that we are very limited, right, in the type of interaction that we're able to have. And I wanted to thank those community members. Uh, I think we had 16 or so uh, at one week. Uh, we had another group of close to 20 uh, join. And, and really, the idea was threefold. Um, and anyone is welcome to come, but of course, um, um, the, the, the focus of the conversation would be with, with the district that I uh, represent, which is District 3. But really, I had three things in mind. One was just to provide a space to interact uh, with community members. Uh, and, and that would include our um, staff from our schools. So in my eight elementary schools, the middle school, the high school, these would not be formal district meetings. This is just me. Uh, getting together with anyone in District 3 uh, and provide, I'm I, I providing just general updates um, because oftentimes we, you know, we don't get a chance to interact in ways that uh, we can you know, provide updates beyond all the things that our district is doing, all right, in terms of communicating to parents. The second is to answer general questions. Um, but third is, and I think we're missing this, all right, the big piece of what we've heard of what we see and what we hear, what we feel is building community, just having a space where folks could connect with each other. I think it was board member Kerr, uh, if not at the last meeting, a couple of meetings ago that highlighted that uh, normally folks would be able to share a few words, either dropping off students or picking up students uh, with each other. And so I wanted to sort of take a, uh, a stab, uh, so to speak at, uh, you know, maybe providing that space. So. I've found our conversations very rich um, and I, I've heard from the folks that have participated in it uh, that they are appreciative of that. So I'd like to start sharing at upcoming board meetings uh, some of what I've heard back uh, in those conversations and, and also acknowledge uh, that, um, you know, we're, we're trying our very best to connect with our communities uh, through this community, virtual community engagement. So I wanted to share that as an update uh, President Craighead, not, not to put any pressure on any of our colleagues, uh, but just that our district is really thinking outside of the box. And I know we've had conversations about 
how to better connect, parent engagement, community engagement. So uh, the, the last two times that I've met with community members during these virtual office hours have been uh, um, very rich uh, in terms of that community building uh, aspect. Um, I think that is it for my end. Before we move on, I want to ask you a couple of questions about that. I think that's a great idea and I'd love your reasons behind that. Um, who from the district helped you advertise or get the word out or set it up? You, you did that on your own? Yeah, and I, and I want to stress, um, thank you for the question, uh, Madam Chair. I didn't want for folks to feel, whether it was community members or our staff, um, an additional pressure to have a formal district space. So this is just me. I just, you know, created a Zoom link, uh, you know, blasted it out through my networks. And, and, and the invitation was, like I said, not exclusively to um, District 3 uh, community members. Anyone could join in, uh, but uh, certainly with a, with a priority on the schools um, and, and, you know, questions and issues in District 3. So, yeah, in, in a nutshell, Madam Chair, I just kind of blasted it through my networks, word of mouth. Uh, I have been providing a few updates here and there on other social media outlets like the Washington Neighborhood Association Facebook group has a has some members there. So, you know, I'll sometimes go on there and just say, here's some updates. Here's my email. Uh, and uh, I scheduled one in a morning uh, time block uh, because some folks felt, you know, after the students start school, they have some time available. And then the last one I held in the early evening, uh, an hour, an hour and a half. And uh, just uh, kind of word of mouth, uh, Madam President. But yeah, no, no formal connection and, and uh, to our district. Formal, yes, to the school board member. But you know, making sure that folks understand that, you know, uh, to put it another way, this isn't a chance to come and ask thirty questions that are very specific to our students with disabilities, right? That if they wanted to raise those questions, that I could connect them uh, with the appropriate staff on our end, uh, and also. If a principal or a counselor or a teacher wanted to join in, uh, that they you know didn't feel like, oh no, I'm going to get like 20 questions from parents specific uh, to that school, right? So just keeping those things in mind, uh, there, I, I wanted to avoid the sort of having it be a formal district-sponsored uh, event. Right, <clears throat> that sounds wonderful, and I'm glad you uh, chose tonight to talk about that. That's inspiring. And I think we'll see more of that. You never know. Okay, uh, Ms. Kerr. Sure, and, and I'll continue that note of community engagement. I was thrilled to join the DeForest Park Neighborhood Association meeting uh, this month, along with Ms. Irving, the new principal at Jordan High School. So it was an opportunity to introduce her uh, to some of our North Long Beach community members and give her the opportunity to tell what her vision for Jordan is and how she's supporting students and also give the opportunity for neighbors to uh, connect with the school, uh, maybe in new and unique ways, especially during COVID. So thank you to DeForest Park and to Ms. Irving for taking uh, the time at the end of, the, of a busy day uh, to do that work. I also wanted to thank Dr. Baker for joining me last week. Uh, I've done this a couple times as I've been a board member and I've called it a back to school briefing. And this year we called it an LBUSD update. And it's an opportunity to reach out to some of our local legislators and elected officials to give them an update of what's happening in Long Beach Unified. So we are thrilled to be joined with representatives from Congressman Lowenthal's office, Congresswoman Nanette Barragon, uh, Speaker Rendon's office, Assembly Member O'Donnell, Council member Rex Richardson popped in for a bit and his staff and also staff members for council members in Dejas and council member Austin. And it was an opportunity to introduce Dr. Baker to some of our local leaders. And while she has been with us for 28 years and we know her, it was a chance for her to introduce herself and what her vision is as the new superintendent of Long Beach Unified and to really reinforce with our local legislators and electeds that we know that we work together to support students and families in our shared constituencies and in our community. Um, so they got to ask some questions, whether they were COVID related or not, uh, about what's happening in Long Beach Unified right now, and really just affirming those partnerships and the dedication to provide information 
across uh, constituencies. We know council offices oftentimes get calls and questions about school issues um, just because people think that that might be an appropriate place. So this gives them an opportunity to at least have some answers, but know that they can reach out any time to connect with us here at the school district where that jurisdiction lies. So thank you to Dr. Baker for taking time again after a long busy day. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to the Hughes PE teachers. So they're trying to be creative in ways to engage their students and get them up and moving. So my house uh, in our front yard, which is near Hughes Middle School, has some barcodes posted, which the kids can come by and scan it and it gives them an exercise to do. And they record themselves uh, or take a picture of themselves doing that. They have, uh, I think at least 20 stations at different businesses that surround Hughes um, and asked me to do it in my front yard. So uh, I offered some Starbucks cards to enter into a raffle to encourage students to come on by. But I, I just really wanna praise the ingenuity and creativity of our teachers to continue to keep kids uh, engaged when it's really uh, a difficult time to do that. Uh, shout out to all of our student athletes who made commitments to colleges this past week. We know that that will continue. Um, and it seems strange that as, and as we are not uh, competing in sports right now, we know uh, that they have bright futures ahead of them as they pursue those athletics in college. So congratulations to the ones who've made those commitments this week. Um, and just really want to encourage everybody to take the week off next week. Take some time for yourself, turn off the phone, turn off the screens, uh, be with your uh, immediate family, please, uh, as you celebrate. Um, and are thankful because I am so thankful for how you are committed to your work, committed to our community and to our staff, how you're committed uh, to our families. So uh, I'm grateful for that. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Mr. Meyer. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Doug Otto and I, my uh, successor on the board, we just finished visiting every single school in district four and we spent over an hour with every principal so that uh, Doug Otto established a great relationship with those principals, got information about the schools, and he really uh, stresses, uh, you know, relationships. So he will be able to uh, sit on the board and uh, come off full speed in terms of his knowledge of our schools. And by the way, he was just really impressed with the quality of our principals. It's a fact I think we on the board already know about, and we probably should acknowledge more publicly, but uh, the talent that we have in our schools, teaching staff, support staff, and our principals is just remarkable. And uh, my hat goes off to each and every one of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Williams. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I spoke with Eric Miller yesterday and the plan going forward is uh, being able to schedule times with all the principals that are part of part of my district uh, and uh, help guiding through that process. I know he talked about that initially with Jill, Jill Baker, but we'll be putting putting that in place. And uh, I know John and Doug Otto are way out in, in front, but that's the bad, the beauty of being able to win early. We're just going to have to play catch up a little bit here, but the process is still the same. Getting him familiar with the people out there and some of the issues that are part of the district. Uh, uh, so we'll be doing that. And I want to just reiterate my thanks and appreciation to our executive team, our staff, our teachers for the adjustments and things they have to do frequently because of this pandemic. Uh, it's, it's really impressive that we take this work on and not just as a, as a, a response, but making sure that that work does produce uh, the kinds of results that are necessary and just really appreciate that work, ongoing work that they're doing each and every day. Uh, so thank you one and all and uh, be safe for the holiday. Thank you. I think I'm just going to build on that and and remind people to be very safe. I know that for me and my immediate family, we have chosen not to travel. 
Uh, we usually visit family in Northern California. We're not going to travel. We're not going to spend Thanksgiving with uh, family members that are close by. We are just going to stay in our little house with our little family. And we've decided to make the sacrifice so it's safer for everybody. And as you all know, the numbers are spiking. And we just in this district are experiencing um, an increase in, in positive cases, that sort of thing. So we're, we're choosing to be very careful. It's not an easy decision, but it's one that needs to be made. And um, I'd also like to report that I attended a meeting this morning, virtually, of course, for the Parent Policy Council of Head Start. And at one point during the meeting, there was an exchange of ideas um, with the parents. And it was such a wonderful example of parents supporting parents and the Head Start staff supporting the parents. And one of the ideas that I thought was uh, really unique is that uh, November 22nd at noon, Eventbrite is hosting a meditation for kids. And so it was this kind of idea uh, and resources that were, um, you know, being exchanged and, and shared. And it just reminded me how thankful I am for people who volunteer, who step forward to help others. And there is a strength in that. It's empowering. And when I see parents getting involved at the preschool level, I know that these are parents that are going to stay involved throughout their children's school years. And, and that's wonderful because as we know, it really takes a village. And the more uh, support and buy-in we have from the parents, the better. It makes the um, education of our, of our students so much richer. And also, I just want to mention how thankful I am for everybody. When, when we have to pivot and make decisions, you know, uh, because of the challenges we're facing, uh, mostly because of COVID, everybody's flexible enough to do that. And I know it's disappointing not to have our workshops and not to have these presentations that we look forward to, all the information. And Dr. Benitez, to your point, we will have that information before the next workshops, because this is something we have to work on. This is not information we can wait on. So I know that that is in the works, that that will be part of our upcoming agendas. And some presentations um, will, you know, will be put before us in regular meetings so that we won't have to wait. So now let's uh, turn it over to Dr. Baker for the superintendent's report. Thank you. I want to echo the same sentiment. I want to thank um, the board and staff in our community for their understanding with our need to postpone the board workshop and just reflect on the reason that you passed an emergency resolution last spring was to allow flexibility in our response to COVID. And so this week was an example of really needing to think about the health and safety of all who participate um, and to make a decision to postpone the workshop and to hold this meeting entirely virtually. So thank you for, for that flexibility. And um, I'll just affirm, Dr. Benita, as your request, we're all already working on the December 2nd agenda to bring in some of the items. So I, I mentioned to President Craighead earlier today, um, tonight might be a short meeting, but we've got, we've got good meetings to come. And so keep your calendars open for, for some staff reports in the upcoming board meetings. Um, I wanna thank Katie Hamilton who kicked off our meeting. I am loving hearing our students start the meetings off. The great decision, Mrs. Craighead, um, to open up with a great report and also just to be reminded of, of why we even exist and why we meet to have that student voice just be present right at the beginning. I just am loving that for us. Um, also had a great second meeting with our uh, my superintendent student advisory committee this week. Um, students who brought a student voice and student perspective to all of the budget engagement that has been going on 
across the district. And so Dr. Salazar led our student advisory, the superintendent's student advisory in an activity to ask them to give a student perspective on what adults are saying are the priorities for budget. Um, and it is very interesting. That will come to you as a separate set of, rec or a related set of recommendations so that you can see how our students are weighing in on the budget priorities of our district. I wanna thank Mrs. Lavelle, who does a lot of the behind the scenes work to get ready for those meetings. I wanna thank Dr. Camarino and Dr. Brown for being adult supporters in that meeting. It really means a lot to the students. And um, something I love is that they wanna stay on at the end of the meeting and engage with one another. So we turn our cameras off and we go on mute and they stay on and have an opportunity to interact with one another. Also wanna wish our, our students, our families and our staff a restful Thanksgiving break. This is really a time to rest. I know there's a lot of exhaustion. Teachers are, are feeling it, staff members are feeling it. And so as much as we can send staff who, who have vacation days or who are off next week, please rest and please take time for, for your families. And we want to encourage you to follow the health and safety guidelines that are out there. We know that COVID continues to spread in our local community, as well as across the nation. Um, we are going to actually be sending something out to staff to remind them of the safety protocols, especially upon return to work after that holiday break. And so be on the lookout for that. And then lastly, I'll just alert the community. Tomorrow's um, our bi-monthly community update that has some information um, about our continued phasing in and our response to COVID, some resources and a message of gratitude. So please look forward to that if you're a member of the community that will be out tomorrow on Thursday. And that's my report, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any announcements? I would just like to say, everyone be joyful, be safe. Yes, uh, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. And I don't know if I mentioned the teachers specifically earlier, because I know tonight we've talked about our classified employees and we've talked about staff, but um, Dr. Baker, when you mentioned the teachers and how hard they're working, I have to echo that sentiment because I know that they're putting in just extraordinary efforts um, to provide for our kids these days. So I wanted to make sure that I mention our teachers. So uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Everybody.